If you're tired of the crowds and the crush of tourists when you travel, well, maybe you should consider some alternate destinations. Stay tuned ahead. I'll talk with Andrew Nelson about Here, Not There, 100 Unexpected Travel Destinations. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner, and this is Some Books Considered. Andrew Nelson is an award-winning writer and editor for National Geographic Traveler. He's roamed all 50 states as well as numerous countries for the magazine and website. And he joins us to talk about his travel tips in Here, Not There. Andrew, welcome to Some Books Considered. Thank you, Dan. Good to be here. Well, this book offers alternative to what people might find on the typical traveler's bucket list. So tell us about the inspiration for this book and how you're hoping the readers will use it. Well, this all came about, I think, because if we can remember immediately after the pandemic was over, we had a ma- as a country, we had a massive case of FOMO, fear of missing out. So everything got really crowded really fast. So some of the most iconic destinations in the world just became overcrowded. And uh, I don't want to say degraded because generally by this point, people are, are, are pretty good at being able to manage, I guess, for want of a better, better word, crowd control. But the experience of, say, going to see the Eiffel Tower, you kind of lose that when you have to wait three hours online to actually get, get in. Uh, or, for example, um, waiting in a traffic jam to get through the Smoky Mountains National Park. So this came about because I had traveled a great deal and I knew these places that had marvelous um, features to them that were in some ways similar to features in other more crowded places. So to give you a good example, um, we all are familiar with Amsterdam. And uh, I should say, too, I'm not suggesting people don't go to iconic destinations. We, we will. They'll always be there. But perhaps if you're looking at Amsterdam and you you know, love this idea of canals in a city and you love the idea of biking everywhere for a, for a vacation or a three-day weekend, then the place to go is Indianapolis. Indianapolis has a great urban biking network that has, and it has huge, a huge number of canals that lace the city. And, uh, you can actually go there. A family can go and, uh, have a weekend, go to great restaurants, have great meals, uh, go to the largest uh, children's museum in the country and never have to rent a car, never have to worry about parking. So they rent bikes, but it's kind of a marvelous experience. It's like being in a European city, only you're right here in the USA. So that would be one way I would talk about here, not there. Um, Other ways might be, for example, If you want a lower cost version of perhaps Bavaria, go to Transylvania and Romania. Transylvania is a lot cheaper than Germany, but they have stunning, the Carpathian Alps are stunning. They have a tremendous amount of wildlife and I'm not even gonna get to the whole Dracula bit, but uh, yeah, Transylvania is a marvelous uh, idea if you want mountains and forests and beautiful quaint, Uh, European uh, villages and towns. Well, before we talk more about some of the specific locations you highlight in the book, tell us a little bit more about the book itself. How is it organized? Well, it's organized around nine chapters. It is, it is organized in a way of, I guess you might, might call it of interest and the types of vacations you might have. So there are ones with romantic destinations and those are it could be Santa Barbara, uh, California, instead of the French Riviera. Then you would have three-day weekends, very much like the ones I was telling you about, where you can go to an American city, easy to get to, uh, low cost. Uh, and then things like unexpected uh, natural wonders or unexpected history. So um, those are sorts of the things, for example, um, in Bucharest, Romania, built by uh, the old dictator Ceausescu uh, in the middle of Bucharest, sort of to glorify his regime. But the building 
is so massive, it's become a tourist attraction in its own right. So, you know, you don't need to go to Versailles and wait in line. You can go to Romania, maybe while you're, you know, in Transylvania and check it out. So that's the sort of thing. We've organized it that way. And we should note that because it's a National Geographic book, it's also filled with some wonderful photographs. Oh, you know, this is what's so amazing. So working at at headquarters in Washington, D.C., I was very lucky. I once went with a, a photo editor and he showed me the archive. And it's the most amazing thing you've ever seen. As you would expect, there are millions of, they have millions of negatives. And it is it's a national treasure. Um, and, and again, you know, I, I am not a photographer, so I'm all thumbs on the iPhone. But, you know, the photographers at National Geographic are literally the best in the world. And I think what you'll see in Here Not There are some amazing photographs. Uh, and uh, I also have to do a shout out to the design team as well, because these are the people who can take all of those pictures and uh, take the text, take the pictures, and turn it into a page-turning book uh, that's beautiful to look at. So the entire team is just great, and I couldn't have done it without them. So, uh, and you know, that's the, kind of the Nat Geo way. We all like to, uh, um, you know, work together. It's a great collaborative environment. Andrew, each section of the book where you spotlight a city or a region is, you know, it's jam-packed with lots of information. And I can see that being very useful for someone who's planning a trip. But it seems like this could also be a lot of fun for armchair travelers as well. Well, and, you know, I kind of did it that way. You know, thinking about, you know, people that maybe for whatever reason can't travel but would like to travel or just, you know, the wonderful thing about books, unlike our digital uh, devices, is that you can set it down and pick it up where you left out. Nothing slides across the screen. Nothing is, you know, scrolling. You're not doing any of this. You can have an intimate, involved experience curled up in your favorite armchair. And again, Here Not There was also designed to be a series of thought starters. It was basically designed to get you guys thinking about what was going to go on and what what was going to happen. So that's the sort of thing that I think is, is um, I'd love to hear up. People are already suggesting to me, the book's been out since Tuesday, and I'm already hearing great suggestions of places I've never heard of about, you know, oh, this is going to be, this would be great. Or, you know, if you find Asheville too crowded, Greenville, South Carolina has got the mountains too, or, you know, this is, this is all really fun. So who knows, perhaps it'll be a sequel. One of the many things I found interesting is that in these alternate destinations, sometimes you can see things that are similar to things you might see in a different region, except that you can see it without the crowds. And for example, I don't remember the name of the city in France, but there was this building that when I first saw it, I thought, wow, that looks like the Colosseum in Rome, except in this case, it's a working facility where they still have concerts, et cetera. So, you know, if you've seen the Colosseum in Rome, you could go here and see maybe what the Colosseum might have looked like when it was in better shape. Absolutely. The, uh, the amphitheater in, um, in Nîmes, France, people tend to forget they think Rome was just centered in Italy, but the empire was so large, you know, it was, they had conquered um, uh, France as well, which they called Gaul, but uh, those cities got to be quite prosperous. So um, just like everybody, you know, it's, it's so funny. It's just like today's city. There's no self-respecting city that doesn't want a giant sports stadium, right? You know, you're not really a list until you have one. And Nîmes was the same way, you know, the city, uh, the city rulers went to, to Rome, saw the Colosseum and said, we need one of those. So they built it and through great luck, um, it was never quarried for limestone. There was no earthquake that brought it down. So it's fairly intact. And they do hold concerts there. Actually, they also do some gladiator style reenact- reenactments as well. So you can go there and watch people with swords and uh, conduct that mostly in the summer. But uh, yeah, and it turns out too that there are uh, a series of these uh, Colosseums scattered across uh, the old Roman world. So if you can't get the Colosseum in Rome, and I was just 
I was in Rome last October and the, you know, the lines, the crowds were so crazy. Um, uh, it was just uh, great. I was meeting with an archeologist and he said, well, I want to show you something special. So we went to a suburban train station and uh, Darius Aria, he has a great podcast on, on, on ancient Rome. He knows it very well, an American who lives in Rome. And um, I'm like, we're taking the train. And he is, yeah, I'm going to take you to Ostia Antica. And I'm like, Ostia Antica. Um, he goes, this is kind of a do-it-yourself Pompeii. So Ostia was the port for all the grain that Rome, which had a million people in it, which was, you know, the biggest city in the world in ancient times, didn't really sit on the ocean. So the grain would come in here, and it was a thriving little city of about sixty to 70,000 people. Uh, the river silted up, the harbor silted up, and it was gradually abandoned. But to this day, you can wander it and literally just get up close and personal with some of the stuff that you really can't do in Pompeii. The other thing is no crowds, very uncrowded. So the kids can climb. The, the big thing there is that, you know, we've all heard of the public baths in Rome. Well, they're the public baths. They also had public latrines. So there they are. Um, you can see them. And the kids love sitting on the latrines and getting their picture taken. <laughs> so kind of some adults, too. So, uh, again, it's uh, Rome up close and per- ancient Rome up close and personal in a way that you, you could never do in Pompeii. Well, we can only scratch the surface here because there's so much information in this book. What are a few more of your favorite places to travel to yeah. internationally that would be an alternate destination? Well, you know, I, here's one that's unexpected, I think, for a lot of people. And it's based on, uh, as, a, as a travel writer, for some reason, you're always going in and out of like two places, London or Dubai, right? So London, I, I know very well. I've actually lived there uh, for a while. And it's so interesting because all Americans want to go to London, not saying that you shouldn't. You have to see London, right? But what they don't realize are these amazing uh, English cities, Scottish cities that are just hours away by train. So Manchester in um, nor- north of London is a two-hour train trip. And it is a city that most Americans will immediately recognize because it is um, – I think a combination of the old and the new and the people are, are unlike in London, they're far more approachable, far friendlier. Uh, and it's filled full of, uh, you know, old school tenements with firescapes so much so that they sometimes use it as a backdrop for an American city when they're filming movies. But what's really interesting about it is those connections. And also uh, it has got, a, it's a tremendous English place. So an English city without, uh, I guess, the, the, the hustle and bustle of London, you really feel like you're connecting with the locals there. And they're a friendly, stylish bunch of people. And of course, they're all music mad, because that was where Oasis came from, the Smiths, Joy Division, all of these great 80s, 90s bands. So if you're, you know, that was my generation. So that was, that was great. And of course, Manchester United football, the National Football Museum is in in Manchester too. So if you have soccer fans, they're going to love going to it and visiting it. But just two hours away, you could even do it in a day. I, I never say I would never say do that. Just stay for stay for a while. You need to get inside a place to really understand it. But yeah, that add add on to it. Do something creative. Think out of the box. That's what uh, here not there is designed to do. I'm talking with Andrew Nelson about here not there. 100 Unexpected Travel Destinations, and our conversation continues in a moment. If you're enjoying this discussion about travel, please take a moment to subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you'll be notified when I post new interviews. And thank you. And Andrew, for those listening to this and living in the United States, what are a few ideas you might have for a quick weekend getaway and the opportunity to experience something unusual? Hmm. Well, you know, I, I, you know, Indianapolis was like that, but I, you know, if you really want uh, another, a fun place that uh, there, I'll tell you two places that surprised me. How's that? So maybe that's a good question. So one of the places was Milwaukee, Wisconsin. I had gone up there to look at it as a substitute for Chicago, a great lake city, you know, on the lake, beautiful parks, friendliest town, 
very, it's got a very gritty, almost a, 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 a working class attitude about getting stuff done and talking to people. It reminded me a lot of San Francisco before San Francisco put on yoga pants. Um, it has that great affability. You would walk into a tavern and of course, you know, they love the beer in, in Milwaukee. So you, you walk into it and you walk into a, a bar and people actually ask you where you're from, what are you doing? And if you find out, Oh, you're a stranger. Well, come join our table. You know, we'll buy you a drink. Well, I've, I've never, you know, we've lost that in this country, but Milwaukee still has that friendliness. So that was really surprising. The other place that absolutely uh, uh, surprised me because I wasn't expecting it, uh, but I had heard from people good things about Bentonville, Arkansas. Now, of course, everybody thinks Bentonville is where Walmart is from, and it's certainly there. And Walmart has, you know, uh, put a lot of money into that town. The art museums there, like Crystal Bridges, first rate. But the bike trails, the it's like the mountain biking capital of America. As a matter of fact, they just built an office building in, in, in downtown Bentonville that you can get up to the seventh floor zigzagging on your bicycle. I mean, very creative, fabulous, uh, fabulous food. Um, they've got some experimental art going on in an old Velveeta warehouse, Velveeta cheese warehouse. They've turned it into a place of like very contemporary, very modern art and performance spaces, something that you would not expect in, uh, Northwestern Arkansas. But, uh, Again, fabulous time, totally surprising. But those are two places that I think, you know, you, you'll you wish when you left that you stayed long. Another thing I found interesting about this book is that I was looking at some of the locations that I visited before, and I found out that maybe there's a reason to go back again to some of them. For example, in the section about San Antonio, because I visited the Alamo many years ago, it sounds like there will soon be a lot more to see if I were to go back there again. Absolutely. Well, they're in the process of redoing the entire area around the Alamo. And I know it's a multi-year plan. And uh, what's really interesting is they're also going to incorporate the rock star Phil Collins's uh, collection of, of Alamo uh, heritage. He became a huge fan and apparently has the best collection anywhere. It's museum quality and he's donating it to the city. So that'll be on display. But the other thing that's been really interesting is that San Antonio's had an explosion of great restaurants and food. And when you think of the various strains from uh, African-American to, of course, Mexican, and then the German, Czech influences have all kind of melded together to create um, a culinary scene that really is unique and, and delicious. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think UNESCO declared it a culinary capital, uh, one of the first capitals to do it. I think San Antonio beat the pants off of um, some of those places in, in, in California, like San Francisco. <laughs> but, uh, really smart. It's, it's, a great, it's a great city and, uh, you know, beautiful. And, if, of course, if you go during Fiesta, that's their version of Mardi Gras. And I've never seen anything quite like that. I lived in San Antonio years ago. And, and yeah, it's a fascinating area. And even though it's been years, I can tell you I still miss the Tex-Mex food because you – can't get any better Tex-Mex than in San Antonio. And it doesn't taste as, it doesn't taste like anything anywhere else. You can't go and replicate it. I don't know, maybe it's the water. Um, I hope not in the river. I don't know. How, <laughs> the river is pretty busy, but, uh, um, you know, and of course the river walk has been extended in both directions. So now you can, another, another great thing is that a lot of these um, uh, heartland cities have really taken to heart some of the urban suggestions uh, people have been talking about in, in Europe and in Asia for a long time. And they're, you know, they're putting it together for some reason there, maybe there's too much NIMBY in places like LA or New York, but you know, the, um, the heartland cities are really embracing all of this and it's great to see. Well, again, we've just been able to scratch the surface here. So to learn more, the book is Here, Not There, 100 Unexpected Travel Destinations by Andrew Nelson, and it's from National Geographic. Andrew, thank you for talking with me today. Uh, great to be here, Dan. If you'd like to purchase Here, Not There, I've placed a link for you in the description below. 
And if you'd like to see more videos about books and their authors on a wide variety of topics, be sure to subscribe, like, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered.